God's children because this is a day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to day four of the 2015 E-Crusade. Now this whole week through Friday, August 21st, we are bringing you the anointed preachers and teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I think are wonderful <laughs> and God thinks are wonderful to illuminate God's word regarding God knowing us before the foundation of the world. Now here's some examples of what you're going to hear this week. God's knowledge and power, Jesus' knowledge and power, the real authority of the believer, Holy Spirit's power and its effect on us, how the knowledge of God of us prior to the world's foundation affects man, what effect being in Christ has on man in relation to God knowing us before the foundation of the world, and why most believers don't have power as a result of a lack of making this a heart connection. And then, finally, how do we correct this here on this earth? So take a moment right now to assemble the, the elements of the covenant, a small piece of bread or cracker or some piece of food, and some sort of beverage or juice, and it can even be water, it doesn't matter. We're going to set them aside. Later on, we will pray over them, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. But right now, we're going to just get started, okay? Did you come today expecting to receive from God? Well, if you don't expect to receive from Him, then you won't. So get that expectation level elevated, folks. I want you to know that when you come expecting to receive to any meeting, any any broadcast, anything that you're coming to God for, and you, you come expecting to receive, and you'll come away with uh, a better understanding of God's Word and a better head and heart connection. So expect to receive, and you will. Now, we're delving deeply into God, having known us before the foundation of the world, and just what that means to us. So let's pray. Father, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, just flowing from our lips. Lord, we praise you and adore you, and we not only love you because you first loved us, but we also love you for who you are. We've tasted of you and your goodness, and we want more and more and more. We're greedy, Father. We just really want all of you. So we thank you for blessing this e-crusade that you have instructed us to bring to your children. 
And we give you thanks and praise for blessing and anointing in super abundance the speakers and the participants, as well as the listening and watching audience. Lord, we are so privileged to have been a part of it and in any move that you're making in the spirit and the natural realms. Bless those that have ears to hear uh, what you and your word teach us as we endeavor to know you more intimately and love you more deeply as we come to a more developed understanding of you and your word. Thank you for the gift of utterance that you bless each speaker with today. Thank you for the gift of the rhema word of God, the, the logos word of God, and revelation knowledge that you grace each one of the participants and listeners with. Thank you, Lord, that your crusade touches the minds and the hearts of all who attend and all who access your word through the archives. In the name above all names, the mighty and awesome, powerful, marvelous, magnificent, wonderful name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Folks, my message today is on revealing of the sons of God, and it's a very deep subject. It's rooted in God, and that we need to get into a position where we are so so deep in Him, in the Spirit, and in His presence, that we can gain total understanding of what He's trying to tell us. So let's take a moment and just soak in worship. Let's just steep in it, shall we, before we go on with the message. To hear you 
You know, when Satan heard that man, a man from Adam's line would crush his head and restore the sons of God's authority to rule and reign, he set in motion an insidious plan to block his coming. And what transpired next seems like a scene from a science fiction thriller. Job 1 verse 6 tells us that when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord, Satan came along to convince them to rebel against God and to leave the divine council and take possession of the earth by spawning a hybrid race of giants. Now these half-divine, half-human beings would genetically pollute the line of Adam and wage war with his descendants, so the second Adam couldn't come forth. Far-fetched as this may sound, folks, Genesis 6, verses 1 through 2 and verse 4 tells us that this is exactly what transpired. Listen to this. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now as we go forward from here, we're going to refer to the sons of God as the fallen sons of God. And although it's impossible to know how many giants they spawned, we can say with certainty that the Nephilim contributed to an already deteriorating situation. Um, the word says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he'd made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now, we don't know when the flood occurred, but scholars generally agree that the deluge was sometime between 3000 and, uh, and 3600 BC. And God's intent at this point was to reboot the system and start over again. According to Genesis 6, verse 4, the giants survived the flood, indicating that they possessed hu superhuman strength and great height. So let's take a look at Noah's family tree. Although God destroyed humanity, Noah found favor with the Lord and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives were chosen by God to repopulate this earth. To further embrace the revelation of the fallen sons of God, we need to examine how they infiltrated the generational line of Adam. Luke 3, verses 23 through 38 lists the genealogy of Jesus, in which Noah was listed at, at the tenth generation after Adam. Genesis 9, verse 1 tells us that God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, meanwhile, the fallen sons of God, who had survived the flood, continued to defile the gene pool of humanity. Then, Noah curses Canaan. All right, Genesis 9, verses 18 to 27, reveals that Noah was sexually defiled by his son, Ham, indicating that Satan's plan was succeeding. Now, the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of Noah, his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and, and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. 
So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of save servants. He shall be to his brethren. So he's here, here he's saying, he put the curse on Canaan, who was the grandson, and um, he said he'll be a servant to servants. So he'll never rise up above that. He shall always be a servant to his brethren. Now, Scripture doesn't indicate what Ham did to his father. Some suggest he sexually molested Noah, while others contend that he merely gazed upon his naked body. Um, whatever Ham's sin was against Noah, it was severe enough that his father cursed Ham's son, Canaan. Centuries later, the Canaanites became a constant snare for God's people because of their rampant sexual practices. Now, because of these sexually immoral practices, the Canaanites were entrapped in the ungodly length, which is a spiritual place within the heavenly realms where the orphan spirit resides. It's a barren, lonely place where the sexually immoral live disconnected from the Father. Ten generations after Noah, God quietly prompted a Chaldean named Abram to leave his father's household and go to a land far away that he didn't know. Now, trusting God, Abram packed his belongings and set out by faith with his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot. Now, Satan didn't know that God was about to transform Abram from a moon worshiper into a father of many nations, and that from his descendants, the Messiah would arise to bruise his head, as God had declared earlier. So, God's call on Abram was clear. Through him, all the families of the earth, the nations, would be blessed. Prior to Abram's call, though, the Lord scattered 70 nations throughout the earth that had come forth from the sons of Noah. Genesis 11, 1 through 9, explains that after God separated the nations at the Tower of Babel, he fixed their borders according to the number of the sons of God. <coughs> now, because these 70 nations rejected God, he placed them under the spiritual influence of the fallen sons of God. These fallen sons are the pantheon of gods who have demonically influenced the nations over the centuries through the, the world religions that they empower. So all these miscellaneous world religions are here because of that. Now, although Satan had successfully infiltrated the line of Adam, God raised Abram up in order to give the nations the opportunity to find him through his descendants. This was realized on the day of Pentecost as 3,000 Jews from every nation responded to Peter's call. After uh, God, I and mean, this is a quick, quick history lesson as we race through, <laughs> through the Bible, but you, I'm trying to get you there where we're going. After God called Abram, he led him to the Negev to live for a season, and a great famine forced Abram to leave the Negev and go down to Egypt in search of food. While there, Sarai was taken to, into Pharaoh's household to be a part of his royal harem because Abram was too afraid to say that he was, she was his wife. To preserve the purity of Abram's lineage and later fulfill God's word to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, God rescued Sarai from Pharaoh's harem by inflicting plagues upon his household. Now chased from Egypt, Abram returned to Canaan a wealthy man. Abram eventually settled in Hebron and it all seemed well until a regional war broke out between two kings. And what's of interest here is that one of these kings, Ketelamar, attacked three giant clans. Listen to this. In the fourteenth year, Ketelamar and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephim in Asheroth, Karnim, and Zuzim. In Ham and Imim is uh, Shavath Kirithim. Deuteronomy 2, 10 through 11, and 2, 20 through 21. Conf these, uh, these scriptures confirm that the fallen sons of God, who had mated with the women of the earth twenty generations back now, had successfully reproduced giants throughout Canaan. The Imam had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim. Now, they were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Imim. That was also regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonite, Ammonites called them Zamumim, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place. Now, I want to tell you something. Not too, well, it's going to be, I'm going to say five, six years ago, I received an email um, from a um, magazine, I'll say a Christian magazine that I subscribed to, that showed, um, uh, and you may, some of you may have gotten it as well, uh, showed an um, excavation. Uh, and this, this huge skull in the size of the, next to the size of the people was, it was a giant. It was a skeleton of a giant and it was huge and they had uncovered it and it was over in that Middle East area somewhere. And anyway, I don't remember all the particulars now. It, it impressed me. I saved it. I saved the article. Um, 
but um, I, and I've used it several times, but I don't have it in front of me now, and I should have put it in this to give you all the, the P's and Q's. But anyway, it's proof now today that that is actually true, and it's, the scriptures are, are true in what they say that that did take place. So here we're going to discuss Moloch and the fallen sons of God. Incest is the origin of Moloch, M-O-L-O-C-H, worship. Okay, so that you know that we're talking about. The fallen sons of God, the pantheon of God set over the nations, continued to pollute Canaan in advance of the Exodus and the Israelites' entrance into the Promised Land. Now this was evident in Sodom and Gomorrah, cities that were judged by God for their extreme corruption. Listen to this. The word says, As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister, Sodom, nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, full, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. Now, Lot pitched his tent in the city of Sodom on the Jordan plain. And sometime later, warned by two destroying angels, Lot gathered his family and fled Sodom because of the sinful depravity that ran rampant within its walls. We are there today folks we're past that we're past the iniquity and the uh, sin of Sodom now although Lot and his daughters escaped the judgment that rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah that day they did not escape the sexual pollution that had defiled the land through the fallen sons of God the word says then Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains and his two daughters were with him for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar and he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father's old, and there's no man on earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their... Listen, that's rational, isn't it? <laughs> let's, rational, let's just be rational about this whole thing. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Now the same scenario ensued the next evening, and Lot's younger daughter repeated her older sister's sin. Consequently, Lot's daughters bore him sons, and first was named Moab, and the second Benami. Now these sons of Lot became the founding fathers of the Moabite and the Ammonite nations, two people groups that worship the fire gods, Moloch and Chemosh. Centuries later, when the Israelites entered Canaan, Moloch worship or ritual child sacrifice was common practice. Children were intentionally sacrificed in the fires of Moloch in exchange for divine favor or as a misguided act of contrition. Today, the terrorist group Hamas continues this despicable practice by launching missiles towards Israel from Palestinian schoolyards. Hundreds of Palestinian children have been intentionally sacrificed to influence the nations against Israel. Moloch, the fallen son of God over Israel, is the ruling power behind this evil strategy. Moloch means king or ruler and was directly tied to the fertility god Baal. Now, on at least two occasions, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah about it. Because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they have burned incense in it to other gods, whom neither they, nor their fathers, nor the kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents, they have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come into my mind. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Moloch, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination, to cause Judah to sin. Baal, meaning Lord or Master, was the primary god of the Canaanites. This is all small g, folks. And Canaan, as mentioned earlier, was the grandson of Noah, thus making the Canaanites one of the 70 nations placed under the fallen sons of God. Now, when the Most High divided their inheritance into the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. This means that Moloch and Baal were the fallen sons of God that ruled over the Canaanite people. In addition to exchanging the lives of the next generation for plentiful crops and divine protection, the Canaanites believed that Baal could be persuaded to fertilize their land with his seed if they engaged in rampant sexual activity. Now, according to an article entitled Fertility Cults of Canaan, the Canaanites practiced sympathetic magic, believing that they could influence the gods' uh, uh, actions by performing the behavior they wished the gods to demonstrate. 
sort of like we we're supposed to emulate Christ. Well, they were emulating the, the small g of their gods. Believing that sexual union of Baal and Asherah, the mistress of Baal, produced fertility, the Canaanites engaged in immoral sex to cause the gods to join together, thus ensuring good harvests. Not surprisingly, the capital of Israel, Tel Aviv, is considered to be the gay capital of the Middle East by, worldwide, by the worldwide gay community. No other Middle Eastern country is as tolerant as Israel when it comes to gay rights. Now, just as Moloch spiritually empowers child sacrifice in Gaza, Baal fuels homosexual activity throughout Israel. When the daughters of Lot lay with their father, they opened a gate, door, or entry point for the fallen sons of God, Moloch and Chemish, to legally, spiritually, and culturally shape the Moabite and Ammonite peoples. Doors and gates are mentioned throughout scripture, folks. A gate is an opening into a larger space, while a door is a smaller opening within the larger space. So in the spiritual realm, gates are large openings into the heavenly places, while doors are smaller openings within the heavenly places. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were keenly aware of the reality and importance of possessing spiritual gates and doors. Nearly two millennia after Jacob's death, Jesus stood in Caesarea Philippi and made a declaration about the gates of Hades. Listen to it. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What did the patriarchs and the Lord Jesus understand about gates and doors that we can glean today? This might help us with something. And is there a con any connection between spiritual gates and doors and the fallen sons of God? Well, when Jesus entered Caesarea Philippi, he entered a region that is referred to today as the Golan Heights. The Golan is a fertile region sandwiched between Mount Hermon in northern Israel with Syria to the east and the Sea of Galilee in the south. Now, in the days of Jesus, the Golan was called Bashan, and was the region where the Rephim, or giants, lived. Bashan was central headquarters for these half-human, half-fallen sons of God. And when Jesus declared that the gates of Hades would not prevail against his people, he was emphatically stating that the Rephim, or their departed spirits, would not be able to overcome his people. Now, before screaming blasphemy... Read Psalm 22, verses 12 through 18, which provides a prophetic snapshot of the crucifixion of Jesus and the fulfillment of the Lord's word in Genesis 3.15. And this is what it says, Many bulls, the departed spirits of Rephim, have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation, the raphim of the wicked, has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They, took, they, they look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them for my clothing. They cast lots. Now, the word rapham means giants, but also is translated as departed spirits. When the Philistines heard that David had become king of Israel, they mobilized their forces and camped outside of Jerusalem in the Valley of Rapham. This valley was also known as the Valley of Giants or the Valley of Departed Spirits. Israel and the fallen sons of God uh, have a connection here. Now, when the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, God warned them not to allow their children to pass through the fires of Moloch. Moloch was undoubtedly the chief deity or fallen son of God that ruled over the Canaanite people and sought to seduce the people of Israel to do the same. The Israelites were eventually swayed by the cult of Moloch and began to sacrifice their children in exchange for divine favor. It's likely that Israel fell prey to the influence of Moloch because of their prior exposure to the idols of Egypt. The Egyptians, like the Canaanites, were the direct descendants of Noah's son Ham, and more specifically the descendants of Noah's grandson Mizram. Modern Egyptians refer to themselves today as Mizr, which is a der derivative of Mizrim, um, or Mizraim, like the Canaanites, the Egyptians were among the 70 nations God placed under the fallen sons of God. Israel's familiarity and comfort with Egypt's gods influenced their decision to fashion the golden calf at Mount Sinai. Now, when God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, he directed Moses to pronounce ten plagues upon the ten primary gods of Egypt. These gods were both male and female. Happy, the god of the Nile River, water. Hecht, the goddess of birth, frogs. Geb, the god of earth, gnats, Kiefer, the god of beetles, flies, Apis or Hathor, the sacred bull or cow god, cattle, Isis, the goddess of healing, boils, Nut, 
the goddess of the sky, hail, Seth, the god of crops, locusts, Ra, the sun god, darkness, Pharaoh, the chief god of Egypt, firstborn. Okay, Exodus 32, 1 through 4 describes how the Israelites sinned at Mount Sinai. Listen to this. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods, small g now, that shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, small g, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. God Almighty had delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage and strategically positioned them at the foot of Mount Sinai. His heart was to gather his people, reveal himself as their father, and establish a covenant relationship with them that would endure throughout all time. Now the Israelites, however, did not accept God's invitation to draw near because they had the spirit of slavery. For 430 years, the children of Israel had been told what to do and when to do it. Their basic needs, including housing, food, and clothing, were provided, but they had no paradigm for what it meant to be fathered, let alone trust a divine being they couldn't see. Conditioned by the idolatrous culture that en enveloped them in Egypt and the fear of being punished by their taskmasters, their ability to trust God was weak at best. Now, little did they understand the short and long-term consequences for forsaking God for the calf idol of Egypt. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, stood before the High Council of Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, to present in great detail a series of biblical and historical proofs that traced Israel's early history from Abraham to Jesus as Messiah. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, during this powerful presentation of the facts, Stephen mentioned the golden calf and its relationship to star worship. So let's pick up the story in Acts 7, verses 38 through 43. This is he, Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles, to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your Repham Saturn, images, um, Rempen, Rempen, I'm sorry, I stumbled over the thing, Rempen, Rempen Saturn images, which you made to worship, and I will, will carry you away before Babylon. Now, according to Stephen's defense, Israel continued to worship the golden calf, Moloch, in the wilderness years, for years, as well as dabbling in star worship. Knowing that the nations that lived in Canaan were star worshippers, God warned Israel through Moses not to be seduced as they were at Mount Sinai. So, he said this, And take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. In other words, God placed all the people, the nations, under the spiritual influence of the moon, stars, and the host of heaven as a heritage. Now, I want you to note the similarity with Deuteronomy 32.8, which tells us that God placed the 70 nations scattered at the Tower of Babel under the spiritual influence of the fallen sons of God as their inheritance. You know, stars are mentioned throughout Scripture, not just as celestial entities in the heavens, but as high-level spiritual beings. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, Lucifer attempted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. And looking to Judges 5.20, we see that the stars fought against the Canaanite king Sisera. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Now, next we find it in Revelation 9, verses 1 through 2, that authority is entrusted to a star to open the bottomless pit. Here it is. Then the fifth angel sounded, 
and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Now then, <coughs> given all of this, we must ask, are the stars a type of fallen sons of God? And if not, what is their relationship to Moloch? Scripture indicates that there is a definite connection between Moloch and star worship. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, which provides insight. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, those who, who worship the host of heaven, stars, on a, the housetops, those who worship and swear by Milcom, Moloch, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought nor inquired of him. If Moloch is a fallen son of God, as we proposed earlier, then the unrighteous stars are high-level spiritual beings that work in tandem with Moloch to defile the lands in which the nations reside. Israel wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, friends, worshiping Moloch and the star god Saturn, because they didn't have the capacity to possess what God wanted to entrust to them. Enslaved for 430 years, they functioned according to the spirit of slavery instead of the spirit of sonship. Brainwashed by the Egyptians, they had learned to survive day to day and had no understanding whatever of inheritance or how to rule and reign. Sounds familiar to me <laughs> for today. Numbers 13, 1 through 3 gives the account of how God sent 12 men, one leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, into the land of Canaan to explore for future conquest. Forty days later, the 12 returned and reported their perceptions. Two of the 12, Joshua and Caleb, spoke as sons but the other ten spoke as if they were slaves. We went to the land where you, Moses, sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak, giants, there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger. Oh no. They are stronger than uh, we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we, we are the, <laughs> we're grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we are in theirs. Now the descendants of the fallen sons of God and the women of the earth had infiltrated the land of Canaan according to plan and were so enormous that their size struck fear deep into the hearts of Israel. Blinded, the Israelites declared that what God had promised them couldn't be achieved. Just as they had shrunk back at Mount Sinai, they again refused to draw near to the Lord. Their lack of vision and trust would cost them 40 years in the wilderness. Orphans, those who function according to the spirit of slavery, don't believe that God loves them or that he desires to give them an inheritance, something tangible they haven't earned. Moses' generation didn't trust God, even though he had performed great miracles in Egypt on their behalf and parted the Red Sea during Exodus. After 40 years of purging the Israelites of their slave mindsets, God gave them the toughest marching orders imaginable. Before you, you enter the promised land, seek out the giants of the surrounding nations and destroy them completely. Here, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater than, and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak. Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is He who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Now Joshua and a new generation of Israelites who had been set free from the spirit of slavery prepared themselves to enter the land of Canaan. Okay, let's make a modern day correlation here. On May 2nd, 2011, Osama bin Laden, the founder and head of the militant uh, <clears throat> excuse me, group Al-Qaeda, was killed in Pakistan by SEAL Team 6. 
a U.S. Special Forces unit. Before the announcement of bin Laden's death was made official, rumors spread quickly through the media, prompting large crowds to gather outside the White House, Ground Zero, the Pentagon, and Times Square to celebrate. Like Osama bin Laden, the descendants of the fallen sons of God and the women of the earth, known as the Nephilim, Anakim, and Raphim, were agents of great evil who per perpetrated terrible acts of violence against the nation of Israel, as well as who supported them, any of them that were supporting them. God's orders to kill and destroy these giant enclaves were not the orders of a cruel God who wanted to murder innocent people, folks, but the orders of a just, righteous, and benevolent God who was intent on protecting his people and bringing forth the second Adam to bruise the serpent's head. So let's talk a minute about Jericho, City of the Moon. As a child, there was a television show that featured an expert billiards player named Minnesota Fats. Uh, when I was a child. What I enjoyed most about Rudolph Wandrone, that's Fats' name, actually, was that he perfected the ability to strategically position the cue ball after making a great shot so we could make another great shot. And like Minnesota Fats, God strategically positioned his people on the plains of Jericho for his next move. Now when we understand that Jericho was the seat of moon worship in Canaan, it's easy to see why God wanted it destroyed. God's plan was strategic. Move, remove the chief center of the demonic power in the land and all the other cities in Canaan would fall like dominoes. Jericho's destruction was so vital for the future conquest of Canaan that God dispatched the commander of the host of the army of the Lord to help Israel take it. And it came to pass when Joshua was by, uh, Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for the adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face on the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Jericho was the first city that the Israelites conquered. Why? There were two reasons. Jericho was the eastern gateway into Israel, and according to Ezekiel 43, verses 1 through 4, the glory of God rises first in the east. Second, Jericho, or the city of the moon, meant that Jericho was the spiritual center for star worship in the land of Canaan. The male moon god, Yerah, was the chief god of the Canaanite pantheon, and the female sun god, Shamish, was his consort. Later, the names of these moon gods would be changed to Baal and Asheroth. So, after the walls of Jericho fell, the Israelites destroyed all that was in the city, including all the men, women, and children, except Rahab and her family. As directed by God, they burned Jericho to the ground. Phase one of the conquest of Canaan was complete. Riding high after their victory at Jericho, Joshua sent 3,000 men to attack the city of Ai. But, to their great surprise, instead of taking the city, they were badly defeated. Joshua 7, 10 through 12 explains why. So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my uh, covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things that they have, and have stolen, no, I'm sorry, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have put it among their own staff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they've become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you any more, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Oh, ho, ho. what were the accursed things? Joshua 7.21 mentions three items that Achan had coveted for himself. A Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. Now, it's hard to imagine why the Lord viewed a simple garment and some precious metals as accursed, but further study reveals that it wasn't the precious metals that upset the Lord, but the Babylonian garment. When Moses, along with the elders of Israel, delivered God's commands to the people, he clearly outlined the curses that would come upon them if they chose not to walk in his ways. Scripture is clear that God does not ignore uh, such sinful behavior. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Why would a seemingly harmless garment from Babylon be so offensive to God that he would remove his protection from his people and allow them to be defeated? The answer can be traced to the nation of Babylon. Babylon was founded by Nimrod, the great-grandson of Noah, and the name Babylon means gateway of the god, small g. His centuries later, Terah, the father of Abraham, moved his family to a city called Ur, also known as the city of the moon. Later, Terah uprooted his family from Ur and settled in Haran, the site of the temple of the moon god, Sin. Like the calf idol at Mount Sinai, the primary symbol of the moon god Sin was a bull with a horizontal crescent of, waking, of, of the waking moon placed between its horns. 
Abram, who would later be named Abraham, had been a longtime resident of Babylon, meaning that he himself had been a moon worshiper. Israel's generational line was rooted in moon worship, and throughout their history, God's people were drawn by the alluring influence of the celestial worship. This is why Moses warned the Israelites not to worship the sun, the moon, or the stars, and why the Lord designated Jericho and all of its accursed things for destruction. Achan didn't heed God's command to keep away from the accursed items of Jericho. As a consequence, the Israelites were defeated at Ai. Now, generational, uh, uh, this has generational relevance of the fallen sons of God in Israel. So the account of David and Goliath is widely known and accepted as one of the great stories of all time. Goliath, as most know, was a Philistine. He was a warrior of enormous size and strength. But what many don't know is that Goliath was an Anakim, a hybrid mixture of man and Elohim, or fallen um, son of God. The name Goliath has two possible meanings. It, one, it may mean to uncover, remove, or go into exile. Or two, it can also be rendered as the revealing of someone a secret or message. Now, based on the second definition, it is possible that we have viewed Goliath only as a Philistine giant slain by David and missed a greater revelation. 1 Samuel 17.54 informs us that after David killed Goliath, he took his head and brought it to Jerusalem, Yara, from, from uh, which the first half of the word Jerusalem is derived, means to cast, direct, or instruct as in a way to go through, and Shalem, the second half of the word Jerusalem, means to be made complete, to make amends, restitution, or restore. When Yara and Shalem are joined, they comprise the word Yar... Uh, wait a minute, I have to think about how to say this. Yern Shalem, meaning the, pal the place where God informs mankind that he has made a way for them to be restored to him through the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Jewish tradition tells us that after David brought Goliath's head to Jerusalem, he buried it at Golgotha the place of the skull. Is it possible that Goliath's skull is buried at Golgotha? And what correlation, if any, does this have with Goliath being a fallen son of God? Well, Jesus came and fulfilled what first Adam failed to do. He defeated God's enemies at the gates of Hades. Not coincidentally, David defeated the arch enemy of Israel a thousand years earlier, recaptured the Ark of the Covenant, and buried Goliath's head at the exact site where Jesus would restore mankind to the Father. I want to chat with you now about... Uh, <laughs> Um, about fractal patterns. This is important to what this whole story tells us. A fractal is defined as a rough or fragmented ge geographical shape that can be subdivided into parts, each of which is at least approximately a smaller copy of the whole. The fractal foundation defines a fractal more simply um, as a never-ending pattern. From the Babylonian city of Haran, where Abram worshipped the moon god, Sin, to Mount Sinai, where the Israelites worship the sun, the golden calf, I'm sorry, they worship the golden calf there, to the Mountain of Olives in Jerusalem, where Solomon built pagan shrines for child sacrifice, to Kamash and Moloch, the people of Israel broke covenant with God. The consequences of this covenant-breaking fractal pattern eventually led to Israel's demise and exile to foreign nations. In an attempt to turn the tide, God raised up prophets like Jeremiah to call his people back to their first love and to warn them of the terrible consequences of violating covenant relationship with him for other gods. Sadly, this message fell on deaf ears and the fractal pattern of covenant breaking continued on from one generation to the next. Now, when most people break covenant with God, they are unaware of the far-reaching consequences of their actions. This was the case when David took Uriah's wife for himself in a moment of lust, filled passion. Okay, So years later, David's son Solomon succumbed to the same sexual temptations. Generational curses, that's right. All right? But uh, it was much on a much greater scale. His decision to build altars for his wife's foreign gods opened the door for Baal worship to take deeper root in the heart of Israel. After Solomon died, his son Reboam succeeded him as king, and his reign was short-lived as God ripped away from him ten of the twelve tribes of Israel, entrusting them to a man named Jeroboam. Fearing that the ten tribes he now ruled would go back to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, Jeroboam implanted, uh, implemented uh, an ancient solution, Baal worship, the golden calves. Okay, the Jeroboam said, and Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up and offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord. Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So therefore the king asked advice. 
made two calves of gold and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you uh, from the land of Egypt. <laughs> okay. Jeroboam's decision to station the golden calves at Dan and Bethel broke covenant with God, setting the stage for the rise of Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. Now, Baal worship is first mentioned in the Bible in Numbers 25, verses 1 through 4, when men of the and camp of, from the camp of Israel were seduced by Moabite women into engaging in sexual activity while making sacrifices to their small g, God, the Baal of Peor. Now, as a consequence, the sons of Israel were joined in spirit, soul, and body to the Moabite women and to the Baal of Peor himself. This raises a question. Who was Baal? Baal was the name of the supreme small god, uh, small g god worshipped in ancient Canaan and Phoenicia. The practice of Baal worship infiltrated Jewish religious life during the time of Judges, Judges 3 verse 7, and became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab, 1 Kings 16, 31 through 33. Uh, and it also affected Judah as seen in 2 Chronicles 28, 1 through 2. The word Baal means Lord. The plural is Balaam. In some, Baal was a fertility god who was believed to enable the earth to produce crops and people to produce children. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. At times, appeasing Baal required human sacrifice, usually the firstborn of the one making the sacrifice. Jeremiah 19, verse 5. Baal was and continues to be the archenemy of God's people. In addition to being synonymous with Moloch, Baal was also called Apollo, Jupiter, Nimrod, and Saturn, to name a few. Now, like the kings who preceded him, Ahab worshipped the golden calves erected by Jeroboam, but with one significant difference. He married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians. Uh, Sidonians I'm sorry. Ahab's alliance with Jezebel's father, also known as the king of Tyre, provoked the Lord to such great anger that he decreed a nationwide famine upon Israel through the prophet Elijah. Now, God's judgment fell upon the land because Ahab had opened the spiritual gates of Israel, <coughs> excuse me, of Israel to the demonic influence of Baal at the level never seen before. Oh, so the name Jezebel means where is the prince? It was a ritual cry from worship ceremonies that honored Baal, the prince of the underworld. During her tenure as first lady of Israel, Jezebel attempted to kill the prophets of God while raising up 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. Now in 2008, one of my colleagues visited Israel, and one of the highlights was his tri of his trip was visiting Mount Carmel, the site where the prophet Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Baal, the supreme deity of Canaanite wit the people, was worshipped for one primary purpose, rainfall. Because Israel was still, and uh, it was then and still is today, an arid land, rain was crucial for the successful harvest. In 1 Kings 17, verse 1, we see that Elijah decreed uh, there would be no rainfall and the rain stopped, setting the stage for a confrontation between the followers of Jezebel and Elijah. In an amazing display of divine power, the fire of God fell upon the altar that Elijah had built, establishing the supremacy of the Lord over Baal. Soon after, God released the heavens uh, and the three and a half year drought ended. Baal worship was fueled by rampant sexual immorality and child sacrifice. And when these two elements of covenant breaking were removed from God's people, his blessing was restored. From the start of this teaching, we have attempted to establish biblical and historical evidence that supports the theory that the fallen sons of God infiltrated the land of Canaan both physically and spiritually to pollute the gene pool of Israel, make war with her people, and block the coming of the Messiah. We've also maintained that Satan was and is a fallen son of God who convinced other sons of God to mate with the women of earth. Michael Heiser, a consultant for Logos Bible Software, says that the Hebrew word for earth, eris, Eris is also rendered in con uh, certain contexts of the Bible as Sheol, or the underworld. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 adds the star of the morning, identified as Lucifer in the King James Version, uh, and once attempted to exalt his throne above the stars of God, but God threw him down to the earth, the underworld. If Satan is a fallen son of God and was thrown to earth to rule the underworld, then it's clear that his strategy was to fight Israel on the ground through the gods, small g, of the surrounding nations. Prior to entering the Promised Land, Moses made it explicitly clear that if the Israelites succumbed to the sexual practices of the Canaanite people and sacrificed their children in the fires of Moloch, God would spit them out. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things, for by all these nations are defiled. 
All these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation, or any stranger who dwells among you, for all these abominations the men of the land have done, who were before you. And thus the land is defiled. Lest the land vomit you out, as when you defile it, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. For whoever commits any of these abominations, the persons who commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Now when a generational sacrifice, I've got a, I'm running out of time. <laughs> when a generation sacrifices its children in exchange for protection, prosperity, or convenience, it opens the door for the spirit of death to destroy future generations. Likewise, when a generation condones and practices abhorrent forms of sexual, uh, uh, sexuality outside the covenant of marriage, it defiles future generations and opens the door for the spirit of rebellion. So let's take a quick look at the generational relevance of the sons of God today. <clears throat> I received an email early uh, in early 2013 from a post-grad student of mine, and it offered profound insight regarding Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6, which states the following. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now my student wrote this, It was the intent of the Lord that sexual intercourse between two people would be within the covenant and safety of marriage. At that time a person would no longer be under the authority of their father and mother, and would be joined to their spouse. This is a spiritual principle that affects a person's spirit, soul, and body. By contrast, if sexual intercourse between two individuals occurred while still under their parents' roof, the person would likewise no longer be under their parents' authority and would be joined to their partner. As a result, the individual would have cause to rebel against their parents' authority as their spirit would recognize that they were joined to someone else. Does Elijah come to turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers and, the, and vice versa to deal with this issue? Okay, well, when the spirit of Elijah supernaturally turns the hearts to the fathers back to the children and vice versa, it's much more than an act of recon reconciliation, friends. When the, Mal when the Malachi 4, 5 through 6 prophecy goes into effect, a spiritual breakthrough occurs. That removes from a person's generational line both the toxic slime of Moloch and Baal and the spirit of witchcraft that resulted from rebelling against their parents' authority. Luke 1, 15 through 17 confirms this. Listen to this. For he, John the Baptist, will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and, those, uh, and the disobedient, those who are rebellious, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Is it possible that when parents repent to their children for their own sexual sins that revival will follow? Well, if so, this means that parents will need to dialogue openly with ho honestly about their sexual past. And when the spirit of Elijah moves, God will begin to heal the land. Now, earlier in speaking about possessing gates, you know, I briefly alluded to Jesus' declaration at Caesarea Philippi that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church and that the bulls, to which the psalmist referred to in Psalm 22, verses 12 through 13, were the raphim or, uh, uh, or departed spirits of the chief leaders of the earth. The Hebrew word repaim is um, translated as ghosts of the dead. Shades, the sunken ones, are those who dwell in the netherworld. Hell, Shoal, is excited about you, to meet you at, at your coming. It stirs up the dead, rape him, for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. They all speak and say to you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Shoal, and the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you, and worms, over, and worms cover you. All right, when the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek in ancient Alexandria, about 200 B.C., the word Hades, the Greek underworld, was substituted for Sheol. When um, Jesus arrived in Caesarea Philippi, which is located in the region of Bashan, and declared that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church, he was saying that the Repaim, who lived in the netherworld, Hades or Sheol, would not be able to stop his church from advancing. In his article, The Natchez, um, uh, and his seed, Michael Heiser, unlocks the meaning of the word Bashan. 
The place name Bashan is spelled Batham, B-A-T-H-A-M, meaning serpent. Bashan was the place of the serpent. And this brings us full circle to Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15, where we learn that the serpent, or Natchez, the um, Hebrew adjective for shining one, was told that Eve, Eve's seed would bruise his head. All right, if Bashan is translated serpent, then who are the cows of Bashan that are referred to in Amos 4.1? Amos 3.14 provides the first clue. That in the day I punish Israel for their transgressions, I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Amos 8.6 offers a second clue. Those who swear by the sin of Samar Samaria, uh, or Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, okay, 1 Kings 2.228, 28 through 31 tells us that Jeroboam set up two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan, remember? So the king, uh, then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue, but all, but all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass... When all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none who followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam the son of Solomon. Next, Judges 18, 30-31 reveals that the tribe of Dan set up a carved image when they entered the Promised Land. Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image, the, and Jonathan the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, uh, Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of captivity of the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Deuteronomy 33, verse 22, provides a final clue, folks. Dan is a lion's whelp, cub. He shall leap from Bashan. So, what can we conclude about the cows of Bashan? They were fallen sons of God that demonically undergirded Baal worship in Israel and were the spiritual powers that encircled Jesus while he hung on the cross, as prophesied in Psalm 22, verses 12 through 13. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. My friends, all of creation waits for the revealed sons of God. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Before the fall, Adam and Eve experienced what it meant to be God's son and daughter as they basked in the glow of their father's ever-present affection. By design, Satan drew Adam and Eve away from the security of their father's loving arms and convinced them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And immediately, three changes occurred. They became estranged from the Father as their gaze shifted from Him onto themselves. They lost the experiential, er, experiential knowledge of God's embrace that they were His precious son and daughter. They became estranged from the heavenly realms and lost sight of their supernatural position that God originally gave to them as the sons of God. And Ephesians 1, 3 through 3-6 explains that although sins altered the first couple's relationship with God, their standing or position with Him did not change. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. Did you receive this this morning? I pray that you did. I, I know I raced through it because there's a lot to say, but it's all that history had to be brought up so that you'd know who you are. If you need further information or he help understanding these lessons from any of us, we archive them here on Spreaker.com and also on our website, themasterstouch.org, where you'll find them on the navigation bar under eCrusade2015. They are also archived on YouTube.com, and a link to them is on Twitter and Google+, and they can be found on Facebook as well. I encourage you to go back to them, listen to them again, over and over again. Each one of our speakers has been blessed with an insight that you cannot even begin to fathom on this subject. And you need to know who you are in Christ. And if we aren't in Christ, we fall under what I just told you this morning. Okay? All right. And I am four minutes over my, my time. Oh, I can't believe it. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sharon Thomas. Dr. Sherry is a friend of mine and a colleague, and I have known her for so many years. She was licensed and ordained in ministry, joined the Master's Touch Healing School as an instructor, and Dr. Sherry relocated on a call from God to minister in Queen Creek, Arizona, where under Dr. Sharon Thomas' ministry, she ministers in both Maricopa and Pinal County jail systems. She is the chaplain at Two Banner Hospitals and at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She is a regularly scheduled speaker at the Dream Center in Phoenix, Arizona, and sits on the executive board of the Santan Valley Substance Abuse Coalition. Dr. Sherry is a talented author and has written the book, the God Effect. She's also in the process of, re of writing another one that she'll tell you about. And it is available through her ministry, and you can get it through the, the Master's Touch uh, org as well. Dr. Sherry keeps busy interacting with a myriad of ministries, assisting them, and as the Holy Spirit directs, allows her ministry to become a para ministry. It comes alongside to lift up and establish uh, the newly established churches as well as uh, well established, uh, already established churches and ministries in her area. Dr. Sherry is available for speaking engagements and may be contacted via email at drsherry777 at gmail.com. That's D-R-S-H-A-R-I-777 at gmail.com. Dr. Sherry, will you open us in prayer and then go right on into your message, please? I would love to. Father, we pass in your presence and we thank you for all that you do for us, for your love, your re revelation, knowledge of who you are in Christ, especially this week, and, and who we are in our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you for the word we just heard, the history uh, that shows how the evil has developed on this earth, but also how we are still in Christ and we rise above these things because we become new creations in you when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. I thank you for every hour of the word that goes forth from this series this week. And I ask that your blessing rests upon it and upon the speakers. I ask that your word is anointed from your throne room to minister the hearts of the people as they listen to this, and even to our hearts as we hear one another as they speak this week. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that, that we can still have the freedom to do this, and that you will continue to establish this freedom for us. And Lord, now bless this word as I speak it today. Let it be from you. And let me <clears throat> operate within the Holy Spirit's realm as I teach this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to point out that I was watching a documentary, and I don't know if it ties in with what Dr. Stephanie's saying or not, about giants in the land, but they have discovered the bones across America, and I don't know how many locations, of giants in the land in America that have passed away. And they are over eight feet tall and all this stuff. So I don't know if that ties back to what was walking on our earth at that time or not, but I just thought it was an interesting thing to consider. And I thought that when I saw it. But uh, the Bible is real. And, and it's not that uh, science proves the Bible. It's the Bible's proving the re revealed science that's coming along. So let's keep that in perspective. And today I'd like to talk about God's knowledge and his power. A little girl was lying on the floor with her crins and a large drawing pad when her father came into the room and asked, Honey, what are you drawing? Without looking up, she replied, I'm drawing a picture of God. Her father smiled and said, but no one knows what God looks like, honey. Without a pause, she retorted, They will when I'm finished. <laughs> what am I? Those who know me know that I am a woman, a mother, and a grandmother, and now I'm a great-grandmother. Yes, it's a little hard to admit, but that's okay. <laughs> She's beautiful. In the working world, I have been known by my profession. Others know me as a Christian a Bible teacher, a minister, a counselor, and a servant of the living Lord. But what am I really? The truth is that I am more than just the sum total of my attributes. I am more than a list of things. They are descriptive of what I am, but they are not me. In the same way, God is described by his attributes, but he is much more than just a list of attributes. We often make the mistake of trying to relegate God to a place in a notebook, but he's far too big for that. And yet, if we are to come to know about God and who we are, we must begin with these descriptive attributes. Tennyson said, 
Our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, are more than they. The point is well taken. Even though we will be discussing this week the knowledge of God before the foundation of the world, we need to understand that the attributes of God are exhaustive. Studying his attributes and, of course, his knowledge can no way give us full understanding of just how vast God's knowledge is. Before we actually examine the knowledge of God, we must ask the question of what will be the nature of our knowledge of God. There are three possibilities. Equivitable knowledge. Our understanding of the truth is different from God's understanding. When you say that both a tree and a dog have a bark, you are predicating barkness to both of them, but you are not saying the same thing. The equivocal theory of knowledge says that when we speak of God, we cannot fully comprehend him as he truly is, and that what we think of God is different from what he really is. This position was held by Cornelius Van Til, professor of apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary. He said that God and man are not in the same order of being that they are ontologically different. While nearly all Christians would agree with such a premise, Van Til also maintained that God's knowledge is completely different from man's knowledge. Next, we have unequivocal knowledge. Boy, I tell you, first thing in the morning, these words are a real stumper. <laughs> this states that our understanding of truth is the same as God's understanding, that we understand God in the same way that he understands himself. For instance, when I say that Big Ben in London is a timepiece and that a sundial is also a timepiece, I'm saying the same thing with regards to what they are. Does it mean that Big Ben is the same in all respects to the sundial? But it says that they are the same with regard to their nature as a timepiece. Francis Schaeffer coined the term true truth to describe the fact that we can truly know certain things. He sometimes signed his letters, yours truly, but not exhaustively. In the same way, the univocal position admits that our understanding is not as comprehensive as God's understanding. When a mechanic speaks of the workings of a car, he just, his description would be more complete than my own. And yet we can communicate because I at least have a rudimentary knowledge of what is a radiator and a fan belt. In the 1940s, there arose a bitter debate between the Orthodox Presbyterian Church between, uh, within the Orthodox Presbyterian Church between Cornelius Van Til versus Gordon Clark. Van Til taught that even when God is thinking about a particular thing, such as a rose, their thoughts about it were never identical. God thought the thoughts of a creator, while man thought the thoughts of a creature. Clark insisted that there is no discrepancy between God's knowledge versus man's knowledge at every point. Otherwise, man couldn't be said to know anything. Clark would argue that the statement 2 plus 2 equals 4 has the same meaning for God that it has for man. Van Til challenged Gordon Clark to name one truth that he could know in the same sense that God knows. Clark replied, David slew Goliath. He was saying that his knowledge of that event, although not exhaustive as God's knowledge, was nevertheless of the same nature as God's knowledge. Finally, there is analogical knowledge. When I say that there is an analogy between an apple and an orange, I mean that while there may be some differences, there are at least some unequivocal elements and some common elements. The problem with both the equivocal and the analogical views is that when I say that something is true, I don't mean that it is true in the same sense that God sees it to be true. If either the equivocal or the analogical view in the study of knowledge were correct, then this entire debate would be fruitless because no matter what conclusion we came to, it would not be true in the same sense that God sees it to be true. Jesus went against this kind of teaching when he said in John 8:32. You shall know the truth. If he doesn't mean that you could know the truth in the same sense that God knows the truth, and if we hold to the deity of Christ, then also in the same sense that he knew the truth, then what does he mean? Certainly Jesus is not saying that you can only know something that is similar to the truth, but that the truth itself cannot be known. 
the arguments of the equivalentist and the analogical, I can't say the one that studies these, also <laughs> failed to recognize the foundational truth. But they would not even recognize it as such, for it would not be truth, but only a similarity to the truth. They failed to recognize and apply the truth that man is created by God as a being in the image of God. And certainly if this means anything, then it means that there is a basis of communication between God and man. Animals don't communicate with God, but man does. If we say that man's knowledge is not univocal with God's knowledge, then we are forced to conclude that there are certain things that God doesn't know, since he doesn't share in the knowledge that man possesses. On the other hand, we can affirm both the continuities and discontinuities with our thoughts versus God's thoughts. For instance, God's thoughts are uncreated and eternal. This is a discontinuity with man's thought. However, divine and human thoughts may have the same objects, which is the continuity. God's thoughts decree what come to pass. Discontinuity, but it is possible for both God's thoughts and man's thoughts to be true. So we see the difference. God's thoughts are true because they are his, however, are all things potentially knowable to man. Another discontinuity is that God has not chosen to reveal all things to us. And another of God's thoughts are all non-contradictory. I know it sounds like a mouthful, but I want you to understand the difference in the way thinking is seen. So as I started, God's knowledge from before the foundation of the world is just one of his powerful attributes. In discussing God's attributes, the most common distinction made by theologians is to view God's attributes as either incommunicable versus those that are communicable. The incommunicable attributes are, these are the attributes of God that are not communicated to us and in which we do not share. They are self-existence, infinity, infinity, unity, perfection, immutability, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. The communicable attributes are the attributes of God that are communicated to us and in which we do share. They are, and not limited to, holiness, love, grace, mercy, patience, goodness, righteousness, truthfulness, faithfulness, and humility. One of the greatest things we need to remember when studying God's attributes is knowledge from before the foundation of the world is that God is a spirit. Now, what does that mean? By definition, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. In other words, since God is a spirit, he is a non-corporal being who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Therefore, some nouns for God are that God is a being. God doesn't have wisdom. God is wisdom. God doesn't just have power. He is power. He is holiness. God doesn't just do what is just, he is justice, he is goodness, and he is absolute truth. In John 4.24, where Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, God is spirit, the Greek construction of that passage is interesting. It has no verb. The verb is understood. By this construction, Jesus is not saying that God is a spirit, as though he were one of many spirits. Instead, he is saying that the very nature of God is spirit. The fact that God is spirit leads us to three implications. First of all, God is personal. personal. When the Bible speaks of spirit, it describes that which is alive, self-conscious, and self-determined. The fact that God is spirit points to the truth of a personal God. God is non-corporal. When Jesus appeared before the disciples in his resurrected body, he invited them to touch him to be certain that he had truly risen from the dead, because according to Luke 24, 39, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. This means that when we read of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, or when we read of the arm of the Lord being flexed, we should not understand these terms literally as though God has a hand or an arm. We refer to these as, and I'm going to spell it, anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. A true, I could say all these things last night, but this morning. 
attributing human qualities to the Lord to describe his actions. This also means that we should not take the statement of Genesis 1, 26 through 27 with regard to man being created in the image and likeness of God to refer to some outward physical characteristic. The third implication is in the second commandment prohibiting the making of graven images. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. What is wrong with making an image or a likeness of God? Such an image is a denial of the truth that God is spirit. This is explained in Deuteronomy 4, 12 through 19. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that you might perform them in the land where you are going over to possess it. So watch yourselves carefully. Since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that it is in the water below the earth. And beware, lest you lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. And verse 23, So watch yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. Uh, I think it's interesting about looking up at the heavens and, and going by the heavens. I think we call that a horoscope today. And I think God warned against that. Do you see the point that is made? It is that God has no outward physical image. He is the invisible God. He is the Spirit. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And in 1 Timothy 6.15b-16 he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honored and eternal dominion. Amen. He is the infinite and eternal God. Revelation 1.8 I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. God calls himself the Alpha and Omega. These are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. We would say that he is the A and the Z. The Encyclopedia of Human History begins and ends with God. In the beginning, there was God. Now, let me tell you something. The Bible starts with this, in the beginning, God. If you can't get, agree with those first few words of the Bible, you got trouble agreeing and believing with all the rest of it. So you have to deal with who is God? Who is that powerful God? In the end, there will be God. Trust me, there will be God in the end. He is, and he was, and he is to come. This verse deals with God's infinity in relationship to time. He transcends the beginning of all things. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He has always existed and will always continue to exist. This quality is graphically portrayed in a psalm attributed to the writing of Moses. Psalm 91 through 2, which is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth in the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. Ah, uh, you are God. There is nothing that seems so permanent as a mountain. Nothing in our realm of existence is so immovable. Yet God says that he existed and that he was God before the birth of the mountains. The same God to whom we pray is the same God who was God before the foundation of the earth. 
We tend to view existence through a very limited perspective. All things in our realm of experience have a beginning and an end. Such is not the case with God. He exists independently of time. He transcends time. This is why he calls himself Yahweh. I am. I view time as being the equator line on a round spinning globe of the world. It's like we're standing on the equator. We can only see so far forward and so far back. But God is looking down through the North Pole and can see the equator as one continuous line. I think that this might illustrate the way God sees the progression of time. He sees all of history in one glance. We, on the other hand, have a lower perspective. We can only see the events until the globe curves. The eternity of God speaks directly to his self-existence. He is the uncaused cause. Nothing ever happened to bring him about. He transcends the entire chain of cause and effect relationships. There never was a time when he was anything less than he is now. He has not grown any older. He has not become any smarter. He is the eternal God. He is the unchanging God. Malachi 3.6 For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God, that it is the written communication of the Creator of the universe to mankind. As such, there is little doubt that it is the most important book ever written. Yet as we pick it up and read it in our quest to know God, we often find ourselves overwhelmed by a myriad of events of ancient history. The people described therein seem very long ago and very far away. They are of other cultures and of other lands, and their problems and struggle, struggles do not seem relevant to the modern world of today. It may be of interest to historians and stuffy professors and people like Dr. Stephanie, but how can the common man relate to the teachings of a book that was written thousands of years ago? People that just normally walking around, how can they relate to it? Bible teachers have pointed out that the biblical characters shared many of the same problems that we deal with today. But there is still a sense of remoteness as we read of their various situations. For instance, God never spoke to me from a burning bush. I've never been a queen of Israel or a queen of anything for that matter. I was not thrown into a fiery furnace, although some days seem like I have been. Even though I have tried and tried, I have never walked in water. No matter how hard I try, I find that there is still a sense of remoteness between the issues and problems that I face on a day-to-day -day basis and those characters of the Bible. So what is the answer? How can I see the Bible as relevant in the 21st century? The answer is seen in the truth that we have an unchanging God. Malachi 3, 6. For I... The Lord do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, therefore you, Dr. Sherry, therefore you, Dr. Stephanie, therefore you, Karen, and so forth, are not consumed. God doesn't change. He has not learned anything new since the foundation of the world. His outlook on life has not grown with age. Neither have his absolute standards of righteousness undergone any revision. Hello? This is hard to comprehend because we change all the time. I am not the same person I used to be. I'm constantly growing and changing. I continue to learn new things that change my old outlook on life. God has not changed. He is the same as when he created the heavens and the earth. He is the ancient of days. That doesn't mean he's getting old. He is not getting anything. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, according to Hebrews 13.8. His knowledge is always fresh, and it is always up to date. We look at people who have not changed with the times and think of them as old-fashioned. But God doesn't have to change with the times. He is fully aware how times change. He made them that way. He is the one constant in an ever-changing universe. Psalm 102, 25 through 27. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, 
They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. He will change them, and they will be changed. Oh, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. When the universe has come and gone, there will only be one who has not changed, our unchanging God. This brings up an interesting question. How do we do, do, how do we deal with certain passages like Genesis 6, 6? And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And how about Jonah three ten that tells us God repented? If this repentance is to be understood as a change in attitude, then is this not an example of God changing? In answering, we must first ask whether these passages reflect a real change in the character and purposes of God. For example, when Jonah says that God repented in his plan to destroy Nineveh, it is not that God's attitude toward the people of Nineveh had changed, but rather the Ninevites themselves who had changed. This in turn brought about a change in God's actions toward them. Thus, it didn't involve a change in the character or the purposes of God. The sun is not showing a change in character just because it melts ice and ha but hardens clay. The change is not in the sun, but in the objects on which it shines. Neither do I change in my character because I punish my child for disobedience, but praise that same child for doing what is right. Here is the principle. God's character never changes. But his dealings with men do change as men themselves change in their attitudes toward him. Now I want to ask you a question. Is this principle relevant for today? Does the fact that God doesn't change make a difference in the way I live? I believe it does. When I am faced with the remoteness of the biblical records, I am able to balance that remoteness with a reminder that God has not changed. The same God who spoke to Moses from a burning bush, is listening to my prayers right now. The same God who protected the young men who were cast into the fiery furnace can protect me as I drive on the highway. The same God who provided manna in the wilderness can make sure that I have lunch to eat. The same God who raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise me as well. The same God who sent the flood upon the earth has promised that he will come again. Circumstances have changed. Problems have changed. Society has changed and is still changing. But our God has never, ever changed. He is the same God that has known and loved me from before the foundation of the world. Our Father's knowledge is immense. For that matter, our God is an immense God. Many years ago, when I was a teenager, my dad took me back to the town of Pennsylvania where he was born. Before we went there growing up, he frequently shared with me how big the park was he went to, how big the school was, and so forth about the town. The first thing my dad noted, though, when we arrived in the town, was that it had shrunk in size. The streets, he remembered, as wide and spacious, were now rather narrow. He swore up and down that they had sold off acres of the park as it was so small, even when the locals assured him it had always been that size. And so it went for him everywhere. What had happened? Had everything really shrunk? No, it is that he had outgrown it, and that is the way it is with almost everything. The older and the bigger and the smarter you get, the less things impress you. It is that way with everything except God. With Him, it is the complete opposite. The older you get in the Lord, and the more you come to know Him, the bigger God <coughs> becomes. In his Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis tells of a meeting between Lucy and Aslan, the Christ figure of his story. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. Oh, this is because you're older, little one, answered Aslan. Not because you are? I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Isaiah 40, 12 through 15. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, 
and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. And Isaiah 40, 21 through 22. Do you know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the vault of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah was a man who was in tune with the majesty and the holiness and the immensity of our God. This was not due to any lack of growth on his part. He didn't consider God to be great and awesome because he was only a primitive and inexperienced man. To the contrary, the Hebrew of Isaiah is of the highest literary quality. Isaiah was in awe of the majesty of God because he had been an eyewitness of that majesty. At the onset of his ministry, Isaiah had partaken in an experience in which few can lay claim. Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filled the, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy! is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Can you imagine anything more profound than to be in the presence of the creator of the universe? Isaiah was filled with a holy terror. Yet it was not a terror that drove him away, but only one that attracted him to the throne. The Apostle John had a similar experience, which he describes in Revelation 4, 8. John saw a vision with the Lord seated upon his throne and attended by angels. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Do you see it? The song has not changed. John hears the same song that Isaiah heard 700 years earlier. The reason for this is that God has not changed. He is the same God who was, who is, and who is to come. The song is the same today, and so is our God. There are other songs in the Bible to our all-knowing God, many by the cry choir director David. For instance, Psalm 139, 1 through 6. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You do know when I sit down and when I rise up. You do understand my thought from afar. You do scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you do know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. This is a psalm of David. He lived in a day when the world had been turned upside down. He came to the throne of Israel at a time when the tiny kingdom was about to collapse. Surrounded by enemies both within and without, David was under constant attack. The Philistines of David's day had the ultimate military weapon. They had the secret of smelting iron. This meant that their weapons were more advanced in every way. Not only did David have to deal with those surrounding nations who were enemies of Israel, but there were also those who had supported his old arch enemy, Saul, the previous king. These saw David as a usurper to the throne. To make matters worse, members of David's own household eventually rose up against him, seeking to take away his throne. What was David's point of stability in the midst of such unstable situations? 
How did he handle such stress without going off the deep end? How did he cope? I believe the answer is found in this song. This is a song of praise to Yahweh, the God of Israel. It begins with a statement concerning the knowledge of God in verses 1 through 3. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You do know when I sit down and when I rise up. You do understand my thought from afar. You do scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Notice how David pictures God. He could have spoken about how God knows all historical events. He could say that God knows all things, both past, present, and future. He could say that nothing is hidden from the knowledge of God. But instead, David makes this very personal. He says to God, you know me. David didn't want to give you a lesson in systematic theology. He didn't want to give you a seven-point outline that you could place into your notebook and forget. He wants to bring you face to face with the living God. I got news for you. If the all-knowing God knew David, oh, he also knows you. He has searched you and knows you. He knows when you sit down and when you rise up. He understands your thoughts from afar. He scrutinizes your path and your lying down. He is intimately acquainted with all your ways. That puts things into a slightly different light. God knows me. He knows you. He understands what you are going through. He knows your own unique situation. You are not merely a number on a heavenly database. You are not lost amidst the millions. The God of the universe is personally aware of your day-to-day -day problems. This puts a whole new emphasis upon personal prayer. God doesn't have an angelic staff who goes through all of his prayer mail and who only forwards the really important correspondence. Your prayers aren't archived for Joel Osteen's prayers. God personally hears your prayers. He hears your prayers before you even pray them. Keep that in mind when you pray. Psalm 139, verse 4. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you do know it all. God knows your thoughts. He knows your mind better than you do. He knows what you think, and he knows all about your needs and desires. Have you ever come to a point where you wanted to pray to the Lord, but just could not find the words to say? Don't worry, for at such a time the Holy Spirit is interceding on your behalf. Now Psalm 139, verse 5. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. What does this mean? It is couched in military terms. Remember, David was a military man. He knew the value of strong fortifications. He went on to build a whole series of fortifications to link up the tribes of Israel. Here is the best kind of fortification. It is the fortification that God provides. David recognizes that God has set up defenses both behind him and in front of him. Nothing can come into his realm of existence without God knowing about it and taking an active part in it. The same is true for you and me. Nothing, nothing comes into your life that has not first come through a nail-scarred hand. You might be thinking, this is a bit much to take in. Many people have a limited view of God because they cannot imagine anyone with such knowledge and with such power. Do you feel that way? If so, you're not alone. Look at the next verse, verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it to it. And that's David speaking. David is literally blown away by this kind of knowledge. He admits that he cannot grasp it. He cannot imagine that God could have such knowledge, and yet he believes. This is his point of stability. He believes in a God that is beyond belief. That is because his concept of God is not dependent upon himself. David didn't dream up this kind of God. This is the God who revealed himself. This is the God who is there from before the foundation of the world. What else does the Bible say about the knowledge of God? How far does his knowledge go? What is the extent of his knowledge? Here are just a few verses that give us some insight into the knowledge of God. 
first of all, there is nothing hidden from God. Isaiah 40, 27 through 28. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of God? Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. He, uh, his understanding is inscrutable. God knows all things. He doesn't get bogged down in details so that he misses some. His mind never gets overloaded. He is not like last year's computer that runs short on memory and needs an upgrade. He understands all things with an infinite understanding. Secondly, God's knowledge spans every event in the universe. Psalm 147, 4 through 5. He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Great is our Lord, and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. God's knowledge is not confined to planet Earth. He is the supreme expert in all matters of astronomy and science. He created the universe and holds it together at the same time. He is concerned and aware of the most insignificant of events. Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. God knows about the tiniest details of his creation. He knows how many hairs you have on your head at any given moment. He is aware of all things. <coughs> this is a message of comfort. If God is aware of sparrows and their daily problems, then he is also aware of you. He accounts you to be of much more value than a whole swarm of sparrows. He is concerned for you, and he is watching over you. Third, the unchangeableness of God's knowledge. Isaiah 44, 7. And who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation. And let them to declare to them the things that and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. God issues a challenge to those who would compare his infinite knowledge with their own finite and limited knowledge. His knowledge extends to the past, to the present, and to the future. If God knows that there will be an accident at a certain intersection on a specific time and date, then that accident will take place. Nothing can happen, not even man's free will, that will part from that will apart from God's foreknowledge. Can't happen. At the same time, God's foreknowledge is not a black box placed within your soul that moves you in a particular way despite your own intellect and will. You have a freedom of spontaneity that normally allows you to choose and act in accordance with your own choices. Fourth, God's knowledge includes all possibilities. Jesus alluded to this kind of knowledge in Matthew 10, 20 through 23, where he compares the cities of Capernaum to the other cities that had not heard his preaching. Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they didn't repent. Woe to you, uh, Chor Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethesda. And if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You shall descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Jesus claims knowledge of what would have happened in a different situation. He says that the cities of Tyre and Sidon would have reacted in a certain way if they had witnessed the miracles of Jesus. A lesson that we can draw from such a statement is that God knows all of the possibilities. He knows what could have happened if things had been different. At this point, we ought to consider the relevance of such a teaching. What difference does it make in my life to know that God is omniscient? Is this merely an academic thesis on a subject that has little or no value for day-to-day -day living? It is unfortunate that this is exactly the way in which this subject is often presented. Is it relevant? It certainly is. 
if you are a normal human being, then you have certain problems in your life. They might be big problems and they might be little problems that only look like big problems. I have news for you. God knew about your problems long before the creation of the universe. Not only did he know about them, but he also, also made provision for them back then. Dr. James Buswell Jr. confirms that God has built the answer to our prayers into the very structure of the universe. Let me repeat his quote. I love it. God has built the answer to our prayers into the very structure of the universe. God designed the universe with you in mind. It has been custom built to your specifications. He knew everything about you before you were even born. And he has not forgotten. He is not senile. His knowledge is still fresh. He is the all-knowing God. God is also the omnipotent one from the foundation of the world. Jeremiah 32, 17 through 20. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you who shows loving kindness to thousands, but repays the iniquity of fathers into the bosom of their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God. The Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds who has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and even to this day, both in Israel and among mankind. And you have made a name for yourself as at this day. These words weren't written in a seminary library. They were written by Jeremiah in a day of imminent danger. They were written by a man who was witnessing the fall of Jerusalem and who was surrounded by enemies both within and without. These times were especially dark for Jeremiah. The tide of public opinion had turned against him. The king didn't care for his preaching and had thrown him into prison. From the depths of his prison, Jeremiah could still realize the truth, that God was in control of all these events. Yes, God is all-powerful. There is nothing that he is not able to do. He made everything that exists from his power. When Earth's mightiest telescopes continue to explore the furthermost reaches of the countless gal galaxies, they are bringing testimony to God's handiwork. There is nothing that is stronger than God, because there is nothing that was not made by God. This is a great source of comfort for the believer. You need to be aware of this basic truth when you are facing trouble. God is big enough to help. There is no situation that he cannot handle. God is smart enough to help. He knows what to do about your problems. God is concerned enough to help. He demonstrated his love for you when he sent his son to die upon the cross. There is no situation can ever come into your life that is too difficult or too complex for God to handle. He already handled it before the foundation of the world. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. The principle is clear. Nothing will be ever be able to exhaust the infinite resources of the Almighty God because He is Almighty. He is able to give strength to us in our weakness. And I would like you to remember this. I'm going to pick this up uh, in after Karen speaks and finish it from this point on. What I'm trying to show to you is you need to get your eyes off of your circumstances and off of what people do to you and on the mightiness of God, how strong he is, how he's always there for you, how he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. And goes on the Amplified, he will not, he will not, he will not. He is able to accomplish anything in your life. 
in Christ, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. All things through Christ who strengthens us. Quit putting your God in a box. He's mightier than that. He has settled every issue of your life today. Anything you run into today, tomorrow, the next day, every issue of your life was settled before the foundation of the world. He knew what was going to happen to you today. Just like he, in Esther, the book of Esther, the key verse to the book of Esther is Esther 4.14. Malachi, uh, Mordecai is talking to Esther and says that you were born for such a time as this. Yes, he said this to her, but if you won't do it, God's will will be accomplished one way or another. He'll use someone else. Well, I don't want God to use someone instead of me. I don't mind him using him beside me, but not instead of me. Once we grasp the greatness of our God, all things are possible to those who believe. All things. God, that little word, all, is so many places in the Bible. All. Like 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, you in Christ, you are a new creation. All things pass away behold, all things become new. See how mighty that is? You're not even the same person that had the DNA of Adam anymore because you have been changed into a child of God with the DNA of God. You know how we have no concept of the power that is living within us and what we can accomplish if we would remember the greatness of our God. The greatness of our God who can overcome anything has already conquered Satan. Already conquered him. Everything was settled. Everything you need in your life, everything, soteria, which it takes in every area of your life, was settled before the foundation of the world, was spoken into existence on this earth within those six days, and which afterward God went into his rest, because there's nothing more he needs to do. And then it was ratified at Calvary. Jesus died before the foundation of the world, but that blood actually flowed down on this earth and took authority the day he died. Now we had it always, but we don't, and, and we have it today, but we don't understand the strength of the blood of Jesus, the strength of the fact that our God has known us and taken care of everything for us from before the foundation of the world. And all you're getting Get understanding. Get the understanding of the knowledge of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word you know is what gets impregnated in you. The, the, the Word is powerful. But we need to understand the greatness of our God who spoke it and how He stands behind His Word. He, he does this more than His name. He stands behind His Word because His Word is His Son. The most precious thing he has, his son. And now you are the most precious thing he has because you're in his son and you're one of his children. You are precious to God. He loves you. Once you grasp this concept, you will never doubt his love for you again. Never doubt that he will provide for you in all your needs. You don't have to manipulate it to get it done or anything else. When you come into the realization of just who God is. But first of all, you have to come into Christ. First of all, you have to understand that you need to be a child. Like, for instance, uh, if, uh, say for instance, Pastor Karen asked me for something. And I look at her and said, uh, I'll think about it. But if Michelle, my daughter, walked in here and says, Mom, I need this and I need it right now. Baby, it's yours. Now, what was the difference? Karen isn't my child. Michelle is my child. Now, it doesn't mean I, I don't love Karen. I love her just as much maybe as my child. I love her because God loves her and I love her. I love them. But Michelle has position in my family. That's what salvation is, this position in the family of God. When you grasp that this person, it's not about religion. It's about a personal relationship with a living Lord that is all-powerful, has a destiny designed for you to fulfill. You have no idea, you have not walked in it, and it's time you wake up and smell the roses. And you see that 
you have got to come into Jesus Christ. I don't care what Oprah Winfrey said. There, not all roads lead to heaven. There is one road that leads to heaven. It's the width of a cross. You have to bow and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and to be your Lord and your Savior, but you have to repent. And what is true repentance? True repentance is repenting that you never considered God before this, that you never considered that Jesus was God. You never considered that you're here for his purpose. You had a plan, but God has a purpose for your life. So you repent that you've shut God out of every area of your life. What are sins? Sins, they are um, symptoms of the fact that you shut God out of your life. What is sin? It's selfishness. That's all sin is, is selfishness. Walking, I'll have it my way, I'll have it now, whatever. So we, we repent that we have not considered God. We as Christians need to also understand that he needs to be Lord. There can't be two Lords in your life. You can't operate under your own will and God's will. One has to cave under the other. And you have, I get up every morning and I cave my will under God's. Because that's how we walk in the spirit, don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I will pick this up again next time where we will go on and I'd like to point out that there are things for which it are impossible for God to do. Yes, this all-knowing, all-capable, big, huge God has things that are absolutely impossible for him to do. So I'll be back on after a while. I want to turn this back over to Pastor Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> Great message. Thank you. Very powerful. <clears throat> right now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, the pastor of Refuge of Hope, Pastor Karen Weitzman. Karen began Refuge of Hope Healing Room, School, and Crisis Counseling Center as a way to reach out to those who were extremely depressed, oppressed, and discouraged, especially reaching out to those contemplating suicide. Now, her realization that the extremely depressed were actually unable to reach out to others stirred in her the desire to create a way for them to speak privately to someone who could demonstrate the love of God so that their minds and hearts could be renewed through His power and love. She received her training and ordination through the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International in Oceanside, California, and part of her crisis counseling training from Crystal Cathedral Ministries and also New Hope Online Crisis Counseling Center. In, and that's also in California. Her healing room experience began in Miami, Florida, under the direction of myself, Pastor Stephanie Angabritson, Fra uh, Frank Marzullo, and Don Forrester. You know, Refuge of Hope physically moved from Florida to Vilas, North Carolina, where Karen brings the healing word of God to those seeking healing and miracles through the power of God. And Karen continues to maintain a presence in Florida. Now you'll find Refuge of Hope Ministries online on Facebook under Karen Weitzman or Refuge of Hope Ministries and on the masterstouch.org website under Crisis Counseling or Refuge of Hope Ministries. When you come to the website and you look under like Refuge of Hope, you'll see maybe one of the words in the nav bar that says Refuge of Hope. Start looking down below that are all those additional uh, topics because she has a myriad of wonderful information for you and you can just spend hours in it and it's all complimentary. Karen's also available by telephone for consultation, healing, prayer, and guidance counseling or to set a local appointment at 305 area 467-7232. That's 305-467-7232. Karen is a spiritual blogger, which I just love her writing. She's just a marvelous writer. And um, she's also available for ministry sessions and speaking engagements, and she's excellent at that, too. <laughs> so contact her by email at honoringhands at aol.com. That's honoringhands at aol.com. Pastor Karen, will you open us with prayer and then deliver your wonderful message today? We can't hear you. We can't hear you. <laughs> How about now? Now we can do it. Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise of your holy name. You're worthy, Lord Jesus, to be honored, worshipped, adored, and we lift your name on high, Lord Jesus. Father, we give us an understanding of our authority in you today, Lord. Um, 
that we are armed with the authority that you had in this world and that you have turned it right around and said to us, now you go into the world and you take my power and you take my authority. Father, uh, we thank you for uh, the Sea Crusade and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can go forward in your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. God gives authority to man. Genesis 1, 26 through 27, God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God, God armed humanity with authority over the, all the creatures and earth itself. He gave, gave mankind dominion over the earth to rule it. Earth still belonged to God, but it was man's uh, opportunity to rule over it. God, the ultimate ruler and authority of all things, gave humanity its own little corner of creation to rule over. When God established an issue, it's established. Just as creation is bound to follow the natural laws established by God, God follows his own laws. Since God is ultimately righteous, God's word is ultimately true. God cannot go back on his word because to deny his word would be to deny his authority, which establishes his word as truth. Now God armed humanity with authority over the earth. Mankind used that authority to, re to rebel against their father's loving reign. The knowledge of their sin against their father drove them from God's presence, separating them from their source of spiritual life. Adam and Eve and all humanity after them became spiritually dead. But poor choices like this are inevitable whenever there is a choice to be made. And it was necessary for humanity to be able to choose so that they could have the opportunity to truly love God. But the Father had already set in motion the way for mankind to be reunited with him, even before they fell. The plan would develop and be put into place one piece at a time, so in the fullness of times, all things would be fulfilled. So, the battle for authority in the earth started in the garden and finished with the empty tomb. Even though Jesus triumphed over sin and death, stripping them of their authority over humanity, winning for himself all authority, not only in the earth, but in heaven also, the war was not over. The price had been paid. Salvation is secured for all who call upon the risen Lord, but the war is not over. On the contrary, for us, the war has only just begun. All believers have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Our battles still lay before us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, each believer, everyone who's called by the name of Christ, has been given the ministry of reconciling this world to God through the good news of Christ's sacrifice. We are ambassadors, honored representatives of the kingdom of God. God is making his appeal to the inhabitants of this earth through each of us. Our Heavenly Father would not send us into battle for the souls of the lost without equipping us for the task. The Spirit of Christ dwells in us, and we are new creations in Christ, and Christ has been awarded every power and authority. Colossians 2, 8 through 10 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Jesus, having received all authority and power, in turn delegates that authority to his believers. 
This doesn't mean Jesus has given his followers a blank check to spend however they see fit. The authority invested in Christ is not trivial or to be considered lightly. It is not for disciples to use at their own discretion. On the contrary, we are to submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus and be used by him as he wills. So much of the teaching in the church for the last 30 years has twisted the word of God around backwards. If you want to understand the source of the power in Jesus' ministry, listen to the words of Jesus himself. In John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Jesus was submitted to his Father. He didn't decide what miracles he was going to do. He just followed the Father's instructions. He only did what he was instructed to do by the Father. Because Jesus was completely obedient to follow his Father's instructions, God could manifest his power through his yielded Son. Likewise, if we as followers of Christ Jesus want to be used by God, we have to submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. That means more than just confessing with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. It means we have to be submitted to his Lordship. Slaves are obedient to their master, and slaves don't do their own thing. If a slave wants to be trusted by his master, he follows his master's instructions. If a slave won't follow instructions, he is never entrusted with authority by his master. But if a slave is obedient, he is entrusted to do the work of his master. John 14, 12 through 14 says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring, bring glory to the, flock, to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now Jesus tells his followers that they will do the works he is doing, and greater, because he is going to the Father. Many teachers have taken John 14, 12 through 14, and made lots of money telling churches that God will do whatever a person wants if they ask in the name of Jesus. But look at the meaning of what Jesus is saying. It's spelled out in the parentheses. Jesus is saying, I will do whatever you ask in my authority and character so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. This is a far cry from most teachings, but it fits in perfectly with the context of Jesus' ministry. Jesus exercised miraculous power because he only did what he saw the Father doing. The Father approved of Jesus' submitted life to and proved it with signs and wonders and miraculous displays of God's power. We are told that we will do these same things if, like Jesus, we are submitted and ask in the authority and character of Jesus so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. God put his seal of approval on Jesus' submitted life and worked miracles through him. Acts 2.22, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. God likewise approved of the ministry of Paul and Barnabas and made it possible for signs and wonders to be done by working through them. Acts 14, verse 3, So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. God approves of the gospel message of salvation with his miraculous seal of approval and displays his power, not as many individuals desire, but according to the will of the Holy Spirit, which is at work among humanity. Hebrews 2 through 4, God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. From Let's take a look at the pattern of events from Jesus' ministry to the present day. God approves his servants and his message of salvation with signs and wonders and miraculous events. Many religious teachers will say those displays of power have been done away with. They are not for today. If God was still doing these things, we would see them now. But listen instead to the word of God. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly light, who does not change like shifting shadows. God never changes. He is still in the God business. He is still interested in the salvation of humanity. And let's look at Jesus. What about Jesus? 
Has Jesus changed his message or gone into retirement? Hebrews 13, verses 7 through 8. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we look to our biblical examples recorded in the word of God and consider their lives, why shouldn't we have faith in the same things that they had faith in? Perhaps if we did, we would have the same results. And how about Jesus? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for the saints. He's waiting for us to ask him anything in his authority and character, and he will do it. So uh, why, don't we get, why don't we get the same results today if God and Jesus and the gospel of salvation are still the same? Could it be that the church has changed? Could it be the message from the pulpit has changed? The natural unregenerated personality of humanity always wants to blame our shortcomings on someone else. Teachers of religion say that God has changed his ways and miracles are not for our day. The scriptures prove to us otherwise. But we live in perilous times. Twisting the truth of God is easier than denying God's word altogether. The dragon, Satan, the father of lies, is at work in the hearts of the children of disobedience. To convince people that God never existed is impossible, but to twist the truth into a lie and say that God has no power for today is much easier. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power thereof. Have nothing to do with them. Religion teaches a form of godliness but denies any power for today. If we have our ears open to the words of God, rather than a desire to hear what makes us feel better about ourselves, we will know we shouldn't have anything to do with anyone who appears to be godly, but denies there is any power in godliness. It is godliness, holiness, being set apart for God's purposes that authorizes and empowers believers. God has not changed his miraculous plan for spreading his good news of reconciliation to humanity. If we submit ourselves to God and lay down our lives, crucify our flesh and die to our own desires, if we study to show ourselves approved by God, if we are found to be alive towards God and living in Christ, if we spread the pure and untwisted truth of Christ, if our service to God is untainted by spiritual pride, selfish ambition, a desire to be recognized as somebody important, if we labor to glorify the Son of God and not to glorify ourselves or our cause, if our hearts burn for the lost, not for their sake, but for the sake of Christ Jesus, who purchased them with his life, if we travail for the souls of humanity so that Jesus may receive the reward of his suffering, if we are sold out for Jesus and live only to glorify our Father, then God will have his purpose fulfilled in us. And what is our Father's purpose for us? Matthew 28, 18-20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, the authority of the believer rests in submission to Christ Jesus, the Lamb that was slain, the beginning and the end, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the great I Am. Our authority in this earth only extends as far as our submission to Christ. Christ's authority knows no bounds. If we will die to self so we may live for Christ, then we will wield authority in this earth. If we are submitted even to the death of our own selfish desires, then God's power can use us to fulfill his will in this earth. God's message hasn't changed. We must change to transmit the message clearly. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That was kind of short, Pastor Stephanie, oh, but that's okay. I thought I thought it was succinct and talked about uh, our authority now through Christ. It is, and it does hit everything. I've, I've taken a whole page full of notes, believe it or not. <laughs> i got a lot to say. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Your messages are always wonderful, and they're always so full of uh, the right thing, you know, t just rich in, in teaching and, and, um, and God's Word. And understanding, that's what I love, is that just the understanding just pours out, you know. Um, I'm, I'm finding that the messages that today are really, really spot on. All the messages this week have been just incredible. But, and I don't like that word because that means they're not credible. <laughs> it's been, have been credible. <laughs> but um, as we go through the week, I notice that they just get better and better and better and more and more powerful as we approach the apex of our crusade and um, I just want to thank you for that message and, uh, and for your diligence in studying even after the fact and and staying in God's Word because it really shows it in where you what you present so God bless you and I will see God you back you. here uh, a little later on when we do our com Holy Communion in the altar call okay Folks, right now I just want to let you know that we will be giving you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior after you've listened to all this wonderful word presented to you this morning, giving you an opportunity to find out who you are in Christ. And it's vitally important that uh, you can see from what you've heard this morning that as long as you are in Christ, you have it made, so to speak. You know, I mean, there's things that you learn, you grow past that point and learning who you are in Christ. But God is continually positioning us. He positioned us from the beginning. And, and through, through the history lesson I gave you this morning, you can see it how it, the, it patterns and cycles and patterns and cycles and get until it brings you up to where we are today. And as long as you are willing to give your life and your heart to Jesus Christ, then you're a child of the living God. And he, that's his point, is he's trying to continually position his people to accept him. You know? And once you do, your whole life is going to change radically and all for the better, I might add. Right now we're going to take a 15 minute break. So long, uh, uh, so log in, I'm not long, so long. <laughs> so log back in in 15 minutes with us if you would. Um, you can have a cup of coffee or whatever you want to do during that 15 minutes, some jumping jacks or whatever. Sometimes I feel like that from sitting. Um, and uh, we'll be back here with uh, more of the Word of God, more uh, wonderful messages for you in 15 minutes. God bless you.